All right, good evening, everybody. Welcome to the APES semester one review. We're gonna go through units one through five today. And it's always one of my favorite times of the year because it's the first time that APE scholars are coming together as an APES versus everybody community. So I see some familiar faces already in the comment section. Uh, shout out to I hate taxes. Although I do have to say I hate taxes. Sometimes taxes are part of an FRQ answer. They can be a very effective way to prevent the tragedy of the commons. So uh, don't hate all taxes. Some taxes can be used as environmental tools. But again, welcome to everybody who's joining us tonight. Really appreciate you all being here and doing some review. Most of you are probably here because you have an exam coming up in your class where your teacher is going to ask you to try to recall all of this stuff from units one up through unit five. And so here we are. We're going to go through and spend about 10 minutes on each of these five units. We've got to keep it moving quick. We're going to spend a little bit more time on units three through five because those make up a little bit more of the actual exam in May. And so that's why we'll focus a little bit more on those units. Uh, feel free to drop questions into the chat at any time. I'll try to catch some of those and answer some of those live. We also have a moderator tonight. So everybody say hi to Kyra. She is a former APE scholar. Uh, she's a blue check mark certified APE scholar. She got a five on the exam way back in. Oh, it wasn't that long ago, Kyra, 2020, I want to say. Uh, anyway, very distinguished ape scholar. She helps out with our live streams. She can answer questions if I happen to miss them. She can pop the notes into the chat so that you can check those out there. Um, and she can call things to my attention too if I happen to miss them. So help me out, Kyra, if I miss anything that seems to be important going on in the chat. Sometimes I can get kind of stuck in in apes review mode and just blaze on through so i'll try to keep an eye on the chat if we have a question that comes up uh, i can put it on the screen so that we can slow down and actually think about it together as a group so that can be a helpful thing just to be aware of so at any rate uh usually i have a lot of preamble on these but let's just try to get right into it so we can do as much review as possible got to have a sip of my tea though um teacher voice not what it used to be. So an hour straight of just lecturing is not something I do often. Do a lot more of a flipped classroom with these videos, of course, and with labs and all those things. So bear with me here as we go for a you know a power hour of, of straight apes lecture. Oh, one more fun housekeeping item. Oftentimes it's neat to see where people are studying from. Sometimes people are on the East Coast, sometimes people are on the West Coast. Last year, leading up to the exam, we had somebody from India. So we were reviewing the El Nino and La Nina effect with that student. And it was very different because they are used to experiencing a whole different side of that phenomenon. So awesome to hear who is here, where you're studying from. So if you're interested and you want to let us know in the chat, it's always fun to see what states or countries even are represented. Um, so let us know. And then in a second here, we'll be getting into our review. So we'll start off here in unit one. Unit one is only six to eight percent of the exam. And so we want to keep that in perspective. So I'm going to, again, just show here at the bottom, we'll have a running ticker that basically reminds you what unit we're in and that it's only six to eight percent of the exam. So with that being said, we don't want to get too bogged down in unit one and spend tons of time here. I'm going to set myself a little timer so that I remember not to spend more than eight of our minutes here together on unit one. So we are going to start off unit one just with a very, very brief review here of ecosystems. The biggest thing I want to point out is that when students talk about biodiversity, they often mix up the terms species and population and organisms. So remember that an individual is one organism. A species is all of the organisms of a given genus and species that are the same. So elk could be an example. There's probably subspecies of elk, but we're just going to go with elk. A population, on the other hand, is all of the members of a species, but in one region. So in the whole world, there are tons of elk populations, 
and they are all the same species or there's a few different species of elk, but you get the idea. The mistake that I see students make a lot is that they write the word species when they actually mean organism. So don't say a bunch of species die in a flood unless you truly mean that in that area, all of these species are removed. So that's that's just kind of a pro tip there. I see a lot of students mix up species and organism or population. So try to keep those straight. Individual organisms, populations are all of the members of one species in a given area, little group. And then species is kind of a global, more of a global signifier of all of the organisms that share basically genetic to the point that they can't breed with other organisms. That's what makes them a species. Also, we got to give a shout out here really quickly uh, to Spring Bonnie. Studies at Wellspring Prep. Wellspring is actually the rival of the school that I teach at, but we're, it's kind of like a sister school situation. So shout out to Wellspring um, in Grand Rapids. I don't know if there's any, any GRP students here representing in the chat, but at least we have Wellspring represented. All right, we're going to skip a few topics here because again with only eight minutes we don't have a ton of time to review biomes which i think are pretty straightforward with the exception of very briefly we want to touch on estuaries estuaries are places where the river meets the ocean and they're going to be highly highly productive for a couple of reasons one they're a mix of salt and fresh water so organisms have to be uniquely adapted to those conditions that's an important thing to remember but also they're bringing so many nutrients down the river and dumping them into this area. Think about what you know about ancient history, Mesopotamia, you know, um, cultures that sprang up in antiquity oftentimes were near rivers due to those rich nutrients that were being dumped into those deltas. And so when the river meets the ocean, you have this really rich estuary ecosystem, things like salt marshes, mangroves, they're going to be a breeding ground for a ton of really important species to humans commercially, but they're also just really resilient ecosystems because of how biodiverse they are, how stable their food webs are, all of this nutrient input that they have. So they're really important ecosystems, not only when it comes to biodiversity, but also to human ecosystem services. All right, we're going to skip ahead a little bit more and we're going to touch on the carbon cycle. Carbon cycle is a really important cycle biogeochemical cycle that is to understand in unit one. So with the carbon cycle, you want to remember here that sources are things that are giving off carbon dioxide to the atmosphere or any form of carbon, really. You could give off methane as well. And a sink is a reservoir. So something that stores carbon, that term reservoir can be used for really anything that stores carbon, but a sink specifically stores more carbon than it gives off. So it's going to be taking in carbon at a greater rate than it's giving off carbon. Um, so we have sedimentary rock as a carbon sink. We have fossil fuels as a very long-term carbon sink. But then when we dig those things up, those fossil fuels and burn them, that combustion of fossil fuels is a source that returns carbon to the atmosphere. The reason that that's a problem when it comes to the balance of the carbon cycle is you can burn carbonized fossil, or I should say fossilized carbon, uh, coal, natural gas, oil, that's going to return that carbon dioxide to the atmosphere far faster than it takes to reform those fossil fuels. So what you're doing is you're putting carbon into the atmosphere that hasn't been there for millions of years. And that's why burning fossil fuels leads to a net increase in carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. Let's actually contrast that really quickly with photosynthesis and cellular respiration. These are important concepts to understand. Photosynthesis comes up again in 1.8 or NPPGPP at the end of this unit. We're going to touch on that in a second. But remember that photosynthesis and respiration are basically balanced sides of this equation of carbon going back and forth between the biosphere and the atmosphere. So let's take a look here at photosynthesis. We have sunlight, carbon dioxide, and water that are coming into the plant. Those are the inputs. The plant is giving off oxygen and is forming glucose. Now, when you go to respiration, which plants also do, by the way, don't forget that it's not just animals doing respiration. We have a mouse in this diagram but plants also respire. They also use some of that glucose that they create to respire. But on the, regardless of who's doing it, uh, you're taking this oxygen and sugar or glucose in as an organism. You're breaking that down. You're using that for energy and you're giving off carbon dioxide and water. So you see carbon goes into plants through photosynthesis and then organisms, whether they're plants or animals, return that carbon to the atmosphere in respiration. 
So they are roughly balanced because that carbon's going in, staying there for a short time and going back out. So if you breathe, you're not increasing that CO2 levels in the atmosphere because that carbon you breathed out, you just ate a salad or a hamburger or whatever it was, and the carbon in it had just come out of the atmosphere not too long ago via photosynthesis from some sort of plant. So there you have it, two kind of balanced sides to this biosphere atmosphere cycling of carbon. All right, the last thing we're going to have time to talk about in unit one, if we stay on pace here, is NPP, GPP. So we're going to go to the very end here. I know we skipped a lot. Can't review everything in one hour, but we can review as much as we can here. Try to hit the important stuff. So let's talk about primary productivity. The biggest mistake that students make is that it is a rate of energy production. So it's not just photosynthesis. It's an actual rate of energy production, and we express that in energy per area per time. So kilocalories per meter squared per year. So let's take a look at the actual equation here, because you may see an NPP equation or a problem that requires you to calculate NPP on your test. So you have NPP, like the net primary productivity, is GPP minus respiration loss. And so this is the amount of biomass that plants actually get to take and store as tissue. So some of it, they're gonna to lose to their own respiration. And that's what's represented here in the gross primary productivity, all of the total energy they capture via photosynthesis minus what they themselves use, the respiration loss is like the taxes that they pay. So the net is what's left over. Think of it as your take home paycheck. It's what the plant can actually take as uh, energy and store in tissue such as grapes here or leaves or roots or any other part of the plant. All right, let's uh, touch on just a couple questions here that are coming in to the comment section. This is going to be recorded. It's being recorded right now and it will post to YouTube. Yeah, pretty much as soon as we're done. StreamYard, the platform that we use here has to do some kind of magic, you know, transforming of files and I don't know, you know, internet is a complex series of tubes and then eventually it's up on YouTube. It's magic. So yes, it'll be up there shortly. Um, Melissa had a question. What is the temperature and salinity like in estuaries? Is it changing daily or by the season? This is a great question and it does. There is going to be some daily change as the tide comes in and as the tide goes out and throughout the seasons, of course, there'll be temperature change, especially with the seasons. It's not super critical that you understand that, but the important thing to know is that estuaries sort of fall into this in-between category when it comes to salinity. They're a mixture of fresh water coming in from a river and then salt water of the ocean. So that's really the key thing, Melissa, that you do need to know about estuaries is they are partially salt, partially fresh. That leads to very unique conditions. It leads to organisms that have to be somewhat salt tolerant, um, but also are not required to live in the fully saline conditions of the ocean. On the other hand, though, let's say that there's flooding going on, or I should say sea level rise is leading to, to flooding in estuary ecosystems. That can change the salinity. So the estuary could become saltier as sea level rises, and that could push the salinity beyond the range of tolerance for certain species. So it is important to think about the salinity of an estuary and how it might change. And the way that I would expect that to potentially come up on an APES exam would be in the context of climate change and rising sea levels, which may inundate or bring in more water to, to an estuary. All right. Tortoise asks a good question here. I noticed on some of my unit tests, some questions asked about the nitrogen cycle. Is there any way to easily remember the steps? Tortoise, I wish I had like a great mnemonic device. One time somebody in one of our chats did, and I wished I had written it down. But let's go back for just a second uh, to the nitrogen cycle. And we can go through at least how I think through it. Um, so the way that I think through it when I'm trying to remember them is that fixation is first. So think fixation for first. It's not technically first. They're all happening at the same time. But fixation is the most critical step to remember because it's how the nitrogen gets from the atmosphere down into the biosphere. Um, that's how I remember fixation. 
denitrification, I just think is like we're undoing the whole process or we're starting back over. So that's how I remember fixation and denitrification. And then for the rest of the terms, they're basically telling you what's happening. Like ammonification, we're converting that nitrogen back into ammonia. Nitrification, we're now turning it into nitrite or nitrites. And so that is how I remember them, at least. Assimilation, I like to think of the way that people assimilate culturally. So when you take, when you go into a new country, sometimes it's said that you have cultural assimilation. You sort of take on some of the new characteristics of your area. So those are the ways that I remember the terms tortoise. Unfortunately, I don't have a mnemonic device or anything. Um, one more question here for unit one before we move on. The other thing here too, um, volleyball uh, eight here, is that it's not critical that you memorize the phosphorus cycle. Like you don't need to know like the order of steps and everything. Here's the big thing to know. Phosphorus cycles more slowly due to rocks being the major reservoir and weathering of rocks being slowly. Then it also does not have a gas phase because it just doesn't get to the temperatures it would need to volatilize um, on earth. And so those are the key things to remember there, volleyball, less critical to memorize things about the phosphorus cycle and more critical to try to remember deeply, okay, it's buried in rocks. That's a really slow weathering process to release it doesn't go into the atmosphere. That's why it's going to cycle more slowly than carbon and often why it's a limiting nutrient. Alrighty here. We are going to move on. I know there's a question about biomes. They're not super critical. Uh, so we're not going to spend too much time going through biomes. There is a video on the 1.2. If you go to my YouTube channel later, if you want more biome content, you can certainly find that there. But now we are on to unit two. Um, so let's take a minute to get into unit two. Very critical concept comes up here in unit two. This may be one of the most important slides when it comes to FRQs, especially in all of unit two. And that's because biodiversity is such a critical concept that students often uh, lack details in, for lack of a better term. <laughs> um, to put it bluntly, students just don't remember the three levels of biodiversity and they don't specify them on FRQs. So if you if you have an FRQ as part of your final and you can incorporate biodiversity loss or biodiversity being impacted in some way to an FRQ, especially if it's about human impacts on a given ecosystem, being able to actually link it to one of these three levels of biodiversity is really key. So of course there's ecosystem diversity, there is genetic diversity, and then there's species diversity. So ecosystem diversity is this idea that within one biome, we still have a bunch of different ecosystems that are present. In this picture, we have ocean and then kind of a sand, you know, beach into a forest transition. We have sort of an alpine ecosystem, we, we might call it at the top of the mountain. Then we have what looks like a pretty arid, more of a, a desert um, ecosystem on the far basically leeward side of that mountain, if you remember unit four. So really important to remember that this diversity exists at all three levels. Then we get to species diversity. Now we have all of the species represented in an ecosystem. The more species there are in the ecosystem, the more resilient that ecosystem. And then finally, we get down to the genetic level. And so a population is going to have genetic diversity. So these chipmunks all have slight differences in their DNA they have different genes, different mutations, give them different traits. That's going to allow them as a population to be more resistant to environmental disturbance. So the key thing to remember is there are three levels of biodiversity, excuse me, and that each of those levels of biodiversity offer some sort of stability or survivability for the level above them. Basically, genetic diversity preserves species or populations and species diversity preserves or makes ecosystems as a whole more survivable and stable. All right, we're going to skip past biodiversity and we are going to touch on ecosystem services. Now, this one is like the bane of Ape Scholar's existence every year because how the heck do you tell apart regulating and supporting services? Now, I've caught some flack on Facebook and in other uh, teacher groups here because I have listed here bees pollinating as a supporting service. 
I think it's all about how you think through these. So let me explain. Ecosystem services, first of all, are ways that ecosystems benefit humans monetarily or financially. So they have to have some what's called instrumental value or clear demonstrated value to us. So provisioning ecosystem services, these are taken directly from nature. These are easy things to remember. Things like apples, lumber. Basically, if you take it right from nature, that's a great example of a provisioning ecosystem service. Regulating ecosystem services are a little trickier to understand. They're the idea that intact ecosystems, like forests especially, do things like filter our air. And when I say filter our air, what I mean is they specifically trap pollutants. So their leaves can actually catch and trap pollutants in them, either physically just by sticking to them, if we're talking about dust, or absorbing them into the stomata and actually trapping them there. And that's going to make our air more breathable. It's also going to mitigate climate change because they take in carbon dioxide. Then we have supporting ecosystem services. This is where it gets a little bit tricky. I think of bees pollinating as a supporting ecosystem service because they support agriculture by fertilizing our crops, doing something that we would actually have to potentially do by hand if not for these insects. I've also heard bees and pollinators, though, classified as regulating ecosystem services. Um, and so I think it's less critical that you get hung up on those kind of narrow examples and more critical that you understand for supporting. It's things that ecosystems do to basically create conditions that underlie valuable actions that we already do. So another way to think of supporting is like nutrient cycling in soil by creating nutrient rich soil decomposes and other organisms help human agriculture. So they support the agriculture or the valuable action that we do. And then finally, you've got cultural ecosystem services. Those are things like going to the park, uh, going to a national park, paying a fee to enter, you know, ecotourism, even research or educational trips that are taken to a place in nature or an intact ecosystem, that's considered a cultural ecosystem service. The key here is you don't mix them up with just environmental benefits. That is a little bit more broad. That's not going to apply to human monetary benefits. It's going to apply to stability of the ecosystem or stability of environmental or climatic conditions. So make sure to keep ecosystem services separate from things like environmental benefits. All right, not a lot of time left in unit two. Let's touch on it really quickly because it does peep up every now and again on the FRQ section like last year. Island biogeography. In a nutshell, we're going very quickly here. Oops, sorry about that. In a nutshell, we're going very quickly here for island biogeography. Basically, as you get closer to the mainland and larger in size, you're going to have a higher species richness. You're going to support more total species. One, due to greater ecosystem diversity, but two, due to greater ease of migration from the mainland to these island habitats. On the other side, as you get smaller in island size or as you get further away from the mainland, you're going to have lower species richness for the opposite reason. Lower ecosystem diversity, lower, fewer available niches, and then also just harder to migrate to. And then one other thing to remember is when we get to these island ecosystems, big or small, any island is typically going to have more specialist species due to the fact that they have narrow and ne narrower niches say that one five times fast, and limited resources. And so they're going to basically select for specialists, and especially when you get to smaller islands. All right, and we'll wrap up unit two with a look at succession, since I think it's the most technically complex concept in unit two. All right. So on the top here, we have a process called secondary succession. Secondary succession occurs after there's a disturbance. And in this case, this fire is a great example of this disturbance. On the bottom, we have primary succession. Primary succession occurs when we have just bare exposed rock. So there's not already soil in the ecosystem. This could occur after something like a glacier. Uh, retreats and kind of pulls back and carves away all the soil and just leaves the underlying rock. So the main difference here is that it's going to be a lot slower to recreate all this soil in primary succession. So biodiversity is going to be low at the beginning of succession, both, both styles of succession. 
but especially primary succession where you have lichen and moss that have to actually secrete acids into the rock and break them down. And then over time, those moss and lichen die and we get a little bit of soil as their dead organic matter mixes with the rock fragments that they're weathering. And then you get these pioneer species, which are going to be windborne. They're going to be often windborne seeds. That is, they have their seeds carried in by the wind or dropped by birds. They're often going to be really fast growing grasses or wildflowers. That eventually gives way to shrubs and small fast growing trees as we get deeper into succession. And then eventually we reach a climax community, which is going to be shade tolerant, large trees that take a long time to grow. The important thing to think about here, and this is a nice segue into unit three, is that as we go, typically biodiversity is going to increase, ecosystem stability is going to increase, and K strategists are going to become to be more favored in these climax communities where we have more stable conditions. Whereas the faster changing conditions of earlier stages of succession favor more our selectedness. So something to think about as we transition from unit two into unit three here. And just a nice segue to add. All right, and we're now on to unit three, where we're going to try to spend a little bit more time than unit one and two, since unit three is 10% of your exam in May, 10 to 15%, compared to only six to 8% of units one and two. So I'm going to try to allow us to spend a little bit more time here. But I also want to take just a second to one, take a break, have another sip of tea, uh, sort of catch my breath here before we get into the um, can't say the second half yet, but the last uh, three fifths and catch up on the comment section. Just make sure we didn't have any questions. All right, Arnav, um, great question. It's very possible. <laughs> Kyra's answer spot on. There's a good chance if it's a full multiple choice length exam, like, you know, 80 questions, I would not be surprised if you had to calculate population growth rate. And lucky for you, we are going to go through that here in just a second. Because it's such a feared topic, though, what I want to do is really quickly plug for people the math video. Um, that is the apes FRQ math video that I've done in the past. So I'm going to drop that in because it has all of the types of math you need for the exam. So Arnav, in case you wanted to actually try some practice questions that go with population growth rate, this video will help you out with that. So let me pull that up here for a second. And I'll drop it right into the chat. So that video there, um, which I can um, show on the screen. Oh, that doesn't really help you. That's just a link. Well, anyway, you, you can click that link there or you can always search for Apes Math FRQ on YouTube. The video should come right up. But that video, Arnav, will take you through all of the types of math you have to do and it will give you some practice problems that you can try uh, and then see how you do on those. All right. We're going to move on now to talk about different types of species. So again, remember that species is a whole group of organisms globally that are only capable of breeding with each other. That's what makes a species distinct. So we don't want to use the word species when we mean organism or individual um, that is a mistake that I see happen a lot. All right. Oh, we got to give a shout out here real quick to Sha Yu. I had my midterm today and I'm sad that the review was today. I still got a 95 though. Let's do some poetry, snap, poetry snaps for Sha Yu. You love to see it. You love to see an ape scholar scoring the 95 uh, anywhere in the 90s, even the 80s is great on a on a multiple choice exam. So that's awesome. Hopefully some of Shayu's uh, good exam fortune will rub off on all of you. But yes, Tortoise, thank you. 
Yep, Kyra. Let's let's show show you some love here. When one ape scholar succeeds, we all succeed. We're in this together. Okay. Moving on. Generalists and specialists, really straightforward concept here. Basic idea is that generalists are capable of living in a broader niche because they have less specific needs. They can utilize more total food resources and more total habitat resources. A specialist, on the other hand, is the exact opposite. Like a panda bear, they require a very narrow specific food source, bamboo, of course. And so they're not going to be able to just move any old, uh, to move to any old ecosystem when their ecosystem is disrupted. All right, let's go on to R and K selectedness now, or R and K strategists. So I like this table to help you remember the characteristics of R and K selected. But the way that I remind my students is K selected strategists or K selected species care for their offspring. I know care starts with the C, but you know, bear with me here. And R strategists run away. <laughs> so I think K for care, R for run away. They have their offspring and then they leave but they have tons of them. They have many, many, many offspring so that at least some of them survive. And that's how I teach my students um, to remember that. Josh has a great question that let's just cover really quickly. Some of the research that I've heard from like master students and, and people that study ecology at a high level is that niche is a little bit falling out of favor in, in some environmental circles. It's, it's thought of as a little reductive, but in apes, it's it's alive and well. So the idea of a niche is like your role in an ecosystem. So for example, um, you know, a bee, I guess you could say has a niche. I mean, niche really can refer to your tolerance and your sort of ability to utilize resources in, in all different capacities, whether it's food or habitat. But the idea is it's sort of how an organism fits into its ecosystem. So an, an organism with a broad niche or an organism that has several niches available to it can thrive off several different food sources or utilize several different types of trees or burrows or ways of making their nest. So again, just think kind of the role or the space that an organism fits into its ecosystem when you think of niche. Oh, here we go. Tortoise. My teacher said R strategies could stand for rapid, as in rapid reproduction. Great. One more question here while we're still on the screen. Does the niche overlap represent the use of resource, which both generalist and specialist species use? Yeah. When two organisms um, have their niche overlap, that's going to cause competition. So that gray there, think of that as a resource or a space that they might both compete for. Now that can be reduced if they use something called, I shouldn't say if they use something, um, <laughs> the panda and the raccoon don't sit down and kind of, all right, so you get the bamboo and, and you get the tuna cans out of the trash. But what I mean is resource partitioning is sort of an inherent way that natural selection favors the organism's using different niches or using different food resources so they don't have to compete with each other. So, and this kind of segues into this question, do the ideas of niches and resource partitioning coincide? Yeah, totally. When you have niche overlap, that's when you have competition. Competition reduces success. So let's actually just pop um, back to unit one briefly. And what we'll do there is take a look at resource partitioning because that is, that is an important important concept we should take a look at. So when organisms compete, such as these birds competing for nest space in this tree, sometimes you have sharing of the resource through spatial partitioning. So some of the birds would utilize the top of the tree, some would use the bottom, some would use the middle. And in that way, one tree can serve all of these different birds and their relative populations don't suffer through direct competition. So it's a way of basically saying, I'll use this part of the resource, you use that part of the resource, and then we don't have to fight over it. Now, I'm anthropomorphizing quite a bit. Uh, again, the, uh, what do we have here? The black-throated green warbler and the Cape May warbler, they don't sit down and sign an agreement. It's just that evolution favors their ability to 
develop traits or develop mutations that lead to slightly different use of the same resource. So long-winded answer to your question, um, volleyball here, but that is how resource partitioning reduces uh, competition. So back to unit three. We're going to jump ahead a little bit here because there's some fairly straightforward concepts in unit three that I don't think are as challenging to understand. But we want to make sure we touch on carrying capacity here. So carrying capacity is this idea that there is a limited amount of space in an ecosystem. There are limited resources such as food and water. And so organisms can't just continue to grow forever. So early on, when organisms are far from their limit, when there's abundant resources, they grow at their biotic potential, or they grow really rapidly as fast as their species allows for. But then their growth starts to slow when they start to run out of resources, and then eventually they run into a carrying capacity. But real organisms in the real world don't just magically hit a wall and go, oh, there's 500 deer in the woods. I guess there can be no more deer. <laughs> What they do is they accidentally overshoot because they breed in the fall and then they birth in the spring. And that's going to lead to overshoot. So many mammals, especially larger mammals, experience this where they have too many offspring to be sustained by the ecosystem, aka overshoot. Some of those offspring starve or you could have other you know, density dependent factors that are pulling the population back down beneath the carrying capacity. And so you have this cycle of overshoot and die off, overshoot and die off. Um, another question that comes up a lot on exams is the different methods of growth. So I have to try to find that because I thought I had it right in here, but it might have been a different, might have been a different slide. My slides are like tiny in this streaming app that I'm using. <laughs> so sorry if it looks like I'm squinting. Nope, I guess that's it. I mostly just wanted to touch on this idea of exponential growth or, um, yeah, basically like a J-shaped curve that happens early in an organism's um, period of time being somewhere before resources start to get scarce. Here's the graph I was looking for, though. So again, biotic potential is this idea that you could, in theory, grow without limits really rapidly. Different species have different biotic potentials just because they reproduce at different rates. But eventually there's competition and eventually the resources run out. And so you have a carrying capacity. But what I wanted to bring up here was logistic growth, uh, which is what actually happens, aka that leveling off. Um, so sometimes students are thrown off when they see this term logistic growth. And cat, no shame here. I think this is a, a overly complicated word for this idea that we have carrying capacity, meaning an organism uh, or a species can start to go really rapidly, but then it levels off. That is basically this logistic growth. And the way that I like to remember is it's logical. Like logically, you're not going to grow forever. You're not going to grow at your biotic potential because you're going to run out of resources. So just think of that sort of roughly S-shaped curve when you think of logistic growth. All right, we're a little bit over our time for unit three, but we shouldn't leave unit three, I don't think, without talking about the theory of demographic transition. So let's do that briefly. 3.9 is going to be this uh, theory of demographic transition. So I wanna make sure we touch on this. Yeah, Kyra still remembers it here. If you've taken AP Human Geo, go ahead and drop a message in the chat because it's always fun to see people that learn this already and then already know it for apes. If you took AP Human Geo, like, like I mentioned, you have, uh, you've already learned this. You've already covered it. But if you haven't, let's review here that in stage one, you have really high birth rate and death rate. So much so that population is not growing at all. There's going to be a really high TFR. Remember that TFR means total fertility rate. It's the average number of children that a woman will have in her lifetime. 
Then you get into stage two. Birth rate stays high for a number of reasons. Uh, there's cultural reasons. There are still lack of access to contraception, um, lack of access to a lot of educational opportunities for women. While those factors are improving, they're still not to the point where birth rate's going to decline, but death rate drops dramatically. That happens due to increases in sanitation, increases in access to healthcare, clean water, adequate food supply. All of those factors lead to death rate to plummet, but birth rate stays high. And since birth rate and death rate, uh, just the difference between those is your growth rate, that's going to lead to growth rate going up a lot during stage two. Finally, we get to stage three, and that's where you're going to have death rate continuing to drop, but level off. Its, it's decline is slowing because the country is, for the most part, industrialized and developed. This is when birth rate really starts to decline. And that's due to things like increased access to educational opportunities for women, increased access to contraception. Both of those things play a huge role in dropping that birth rate. Since birth rate starts to drop closer to death rate, population growth slows. So stage three countries are still growing, but they're growing slowly. So take a look at the age structure diagram beneath stage three. It has that kind of house shape where it's like narrow, or I shouldn't say narrow. It's kind of equally sized on the sides and then it goes up into a pyramid. <coughs> Excuse me. That is a great example of slow growth. So the growth is still a little bit due to the fact that birth rate is higher than death rate, but those numbers are coming closer to each other. Finally, we hit phase four where there's virtually no growth potentially even decline because birth rate is so low now that it comes down near death rate. All right. Good question here, uh, Vivian. Let's go back a few slides. See if we can pull up replacement level fertility. The short answer here is that replacement level fertility is 2.1 because not everybody has kids. So if Every single mother and father, every single couple had um, two children, then replacement level fertility would be two. But some people don't have children. Um, and so you basically you need 2.1. Um, into the addition to the fact that there is still a little bit of infant mortality in um, the developed world. So you have to have 2.1 children to actually have two children to replace mom and dad. Yeah, looks like volleyball answered that one as well. Um, well done. So what stage is most developed? Great question. Stage four is going to be the most developed here. Technically, there's a fifth stage in AP Human Geo. That's why I asked if anybody here was in AP Human Geo, because you guys had to know five of these stages. Apes, you only need to know four. So you got off a little bit easy. All right. We're going to move on to unit four, two more units to go. Uh, and so we're going to get into it here. I'm going to take one more break to have a little more tea, catch my breath, check the comment section, and then we'll be going into unit four. All right, I want to start um, not actually on convergent. I just want to go over the four plate boundary types or three plate boundary types. So um, let's see. We had a question here. Tonight, we're drinking uh, ginger turmeric for a little bit of uh, throat soothing, but also some immunity. It's that time of year. You know, colds are going around. I did get my flu shot, but we have one more day till Christmas break, apple cake. And I want to make it through strong. I want to stay healthy through the holiday season. And so um, a little bit of a little bit of ginger turmeric tea uh, never hurt your immunity. So that's what I'm hoping for. Another good question from Josh. Yes, don't talk about stage five in apes. Um, you're only required to know the first four.
Excellent. Yes. I hate taxes. <laughs> we do love tea. That's kind of interesting, kind of ironic because, uh, well, I don't know if that's actually ironic, but the Boston Tea Party, um, they hated taxes, right? No representation, no taxation without representation. So they threw their tea into the sea in protest. So, but you love tea. So if you were going to protest taxes, you would not want to throw tea into the ocean, it sounds like. All right. One more question here that I see while we're kind of pausing between units. Oh, no, no Boston Tea Party on the FRQ. That is a push and you got to go to Heimler for that one, not me. So you guys know Steve Heimler means needs no introduction. If you need to know anything about the Boston Tea Party, go check them out. All right. Fun fact, though, um, the video editor that helped me on my channel and that helped me do the ultimate review packet is the same guy that has worked on Steve Heimler's channel. So that has been pretty cool to get some help from a real professional YouTuber. All right. I don't drink tea every day. Most days I do drink coffee every day, but tea is, is a solid, um, is a solid beverage for sure. All right, one final shout out here before we go into unit four. Hey, Allison, um, tell your teacher, thank you. I'm glad they use the slides. I love sharing these slides. I love sharing this content with anybody who's interested in it. So shout out to your teacher. Um, hopefully they ask you about a lot of these concepts. Hopefully it goes well for you. Okay. All right, and we got to give one more shout out here before we go on. So the background here for uh, Shervani answering this question is somebody asked what the second law of thermodynamics is, and this is a great definition. So you get a, a shout out here, Shervani. Um, when energy is changed from one form to another, AKA let's say um, chemical to mechanical, uh, one form, uh, some of that energy is, is used up, is lost, I should say, to the surrounding ecosystem. It's never lost altogether, um, that's the first law of energy, thermodynamics, right? You can't destroy energy, but it could be lost as heat to the surrounding ecosystem. So the application of this to apes uh, is that you have the 10% rule. Only 10% of energy moves to the tropic level above. All right. So on we go to unit four. Really quickly here, divergent plate boundaries are diverging. They're moving apart from one another. The most common place you're going to see this when it comes to like an exam question uh, would be seafloor spreading and new magma coming up to form things like mid-oceanic ridges, um, volcanoes, and also getting some seafloor spreading. Then we have convergent plate boundaries. They're coming together. The key thing to remember here is that when you have subduction, you have the more dense plate going down below the less dense plate. In continental oceanic uh, convergent zones, the more dense that slides beneath, that's going to be the oceanic. That's important to remember. Then you have transformed fault boundaries. That's where you have earthquakes. The key to an earthquake is to remember it doesn't happen just because the plates are rubbing on each other. It's actually because they get stuck. So they're trying to move past each other. Let's go ahead and see if we can find this plate. And then when the stress that's building up between them, when that force basically overcomes the friction keeping them locked, boom, they slip. And that reverberation that comes out when they suddenly slide, that is the earthquake. All right. Oh, yes. And one more shout out to Mr. Reed. Yes, Mr. Reed is awesome. He's an apes teacher at Wellspring. Um, so always good to see a fellow uh, NHA or a fellow former PrepNet uh, teacher here in the chat being represented. So awesome work, Mr. Reed. All right. On we go to soil. Very important topic. So don't forget that soil is not just little bits of rock. It's not just the mineral components. It's sand, silt, and clay. Of course, those are the three mineral components of soil, or I should say the three physical particles that we usually memorize and measure. But then we have humus. Then we have nutrients, water, air, all the organisms that live in the soil. So all of these things are soil. 
it is not just dirt. <laughs> I always tell students, don't call soil dirt. And if you come to the live stream at the end of the year, I'll be wearing a shirt that says, stop calling soil dirt or stop treating our soil like dirt, something like that. Um, so anyway, soil is really complex. It has all of these layers of nuance to it. Another important thing to understand is how it gets formed, and that's weathering and erosion. So weathering is the breakdown of rock, and that's going to make smaller and smaller particles, but then erosion is the transport of soil, and then it eventually deposits or builds up somewhere. So the way that you actually get layers of soil forming somewhere is by that movement of the little weathered bits of rock. Let's just update our banner here um, quickly since we are actually on unit four now. There we go. So we're going to skip ahead in soil a little bit to our um, chemical and physical properties of soil. So first we have the soil texture chart. That's going to tell you how much sand, silt, and clay is in soil. And the big thing to remember is that the more sand you have in soil, the more permeable it's going to be. Water is going to be able to easily infiltrate those large pore spaces and seep right through. On the other hand, if you have too much clay, you're going to have soil that does not have very high permeability. Water is going to have a hard time moving through it. You're going to have high holding capacity. So let's go back to that slide really quickly so we can go over those concepts. Uh, again, remember, the pore size is key. Bigger pores in sand equal more permeability. Water can easily move through it. You can look at it if you see the picture on the screen here, how much bigger those gaps are between the sand than the gaps are between the clay. And that's what gives rise to these underlying properties that we talk about. So you can see it takes forever for water to move through clay, but it moves really fast through sand. And that's due to high permeability, that ability for water to really easily get into those pore spaces. All right. I don't really plan to go over cation exchange capacity, uh, but let's just talk about it real briefly. It's the ability for soils to basically exchange these positively charged uh, particles. And so when you have high clay content in soil, clay is really nice for cation exchange capacity. It allows for the exchange of positively charged um, nutrients that can be given off from the clay particles that are negatively charged and taken in by the plant's roots. And so if you run a new question on your test about cation exchange and you're like, oh my gosh, what the heck is that? Just remember clay gives greater cation exchange capacity. It allows for these positively charged ions to be traded back and forth between roots and negatively charged clay particles. Um, so that is a helpful thing to recall. Then we have these different soil tests here. Um, we've got texture, we've got permeability, but pH is important too. If you can remember the why pH is important, that's really helpful. So pH is important because when you have low pH soil, when you have really acidic soil, it actually leaches some of these positively charged nutrients out. And so that's going to lead to fewer nutrients in the soil, but it can also make toxic metals like mercury and aluminum more soluble in the soil. So there's this double uh, negative, or I should say, it's not necessarily negative. The aluminum ions are positively charged, but it's a double um, harmful consequence of having acidic soil. Not only do you lose nutrients, but you gain positively charged aluminum and, and um, mercury and other damaging metals that can be in the soil and can hurt the uh, roots of the plants. Great question here. Turbidity would be a measure for water. So if you're measuring water quality, you could look at the turbidity or how much sediment is in the water, but I wouldn't call it a soil test. So good question. All right, we're going to have to skip fairly far ahead here in unit four. And we're going to skip all the way to everybody's favorite topic. El Nino and La Nina. And my favorite, I mean, least favorite, because most students, I think, dread facing an El Nino or La, okay, El Nino, La Nina question on their FRQ. It would be tough. They're, they're definitely tough questions. So let's go through it here. 
The key thing we need to remember is that in a normal year, when you have the normal conditions, you are going to have trade winds that are blowing from east to west. So sometimes we call these the eastern trade trade eastern trade winds or the easterlies because they come from the east and go to the west. This is going to do a couple things. It's going to shift the warm surface water that's in the equatorial Pacific. This is the region where El Nino occurs. It's going to shift it over to the west. So in this picture, you can see it's over by Australia and Southeast Asia. That's going to lead to warmer, rainier weather here. And it's going to lead to something called upwelling or cold ocean water coming up from deep beneath the surface to replace the warm surface water that was blown away. That's really good for fisheries because it brings up cold, nutrient-rich water, oxygen-rich water that feeds really productive fisheries. So that is why this is going to be a problem when we have an El Nino year specifically for fishermen, but also for farmers and for other people. We'll talk about why here in a second. Yeah, Josh, Josh agrees in, in the chat. Or, well, Josh, he said it's actually not his name. I think it's his dad's YouTube account or something. But this user, this ape scholar, doesn't like El Nino and La Nina either. It's tough. I get it. The big thing with an El Nino year to remember, if you can remember this, it makes everything so much easier. You have to remember that the trade winds reverse course. Um, they don't, I shouldn't say they totally reverse course. They weaken, and in certain instances, they do actually reverse directions. But rather than strong east to west, we get a weakening and potentially even the movement from west to east of, of winds. What that's going to do is pull up all this warm water off the coast of South America. So now South America and Central America and North America, we're experiencing warmer than normal, rainier or more precipitation heavy than normal conditions. This could lead to flash floods. Um, it can lead to really warm surface waters. It's actually how we measure an El Nino when you have a certain number of consecutive months of however many temperatures, um, warmer than normal surface temperature. I don't remember our exact criteria, but this is how you actually measure it. The problem is now your fisheries are no longer getting that cold, nutrient-rich, oxygen-rich water from beneath. And so the fisheries are going to collapse. I shouldn't say collapse, but business is not going to be booming for fishermen. You're going to have a lot lower catches, a lot lower catch sizes, um, fewer fish populations are going to be here. And so this is a problem if you're a fisherman. Then finally, we go back to La Nino. And for La Nino, I like to remember La, like large, it's a more pronounced east to west uh, trade wind pattern. So this is going to increase upwelling now. So we're going to actually have more cold ocean water coming up from beneath the surface. Uh, from the depths coming up to the surface. So you're going to have even higher productivity in fishing in the Americas. But on the other hand, we go over to Southeast Asia and Australia, and you're going to have really heavy rainfall there. You're going to have potentially an, an increased intensity of monsoon season there. You're going to have increased rainfall and potential flash floods there. Um, so that's what's going to happen when we have La Nina. So as a quick review, El Nino is when we have a weakening or reversing of the trade winds. So we basically flip the water temperature in the equatorial Pacific and flip the pressure and precipitation patterns. And then La Nina is larger than normal. So it goes back to our normal conditions, but it's even more pronounced. Good question here, Josh. Um, organic matter sinks to the bottom of the ocean. So things like fish or plankton or seaweed, when it dies, it drifts to the bottom and those sediments that collect on the bottom store the nutrients. It's kind of like mixing up Kool-Aid. If you have Kool-Aid and you want it really well mixed, you have to mix it up. So you bring up some of that sugar up towards the surface. Otherwise it just settles at the bottom. Nutrients in the ocean are similar. They settle at the bottom. All right. We're almost there, everybody. We are at an hour, but I promised you five units of review, so we're gonna we're gonna keep it rolling. We're on to unit five, but I'm gonna need uh, to catch my breath here again and 
have a little bit more tea and get ready for the home stretch. So here we go. We'll finish strong with unit five. This is the energy I need, Andrew. It's late in the night. I'm getting tired. And Andrew's just caps lock, ready to rip into unit five. I love to see it. This is actually, what time is it? This is almost my bedtime. Not kidding. Like I, I'm normally, uh, normally getting into bed right about now with a good book. And... Yeah. <laughs> you turn 30 years old and you start uh you start going to bed like 8 8:30 and uh you know it's uh it's not so bad. I actually really like reading. Volleyball's out. That's all right. Review will be up in the morning. Replay will be up in the morning so you can check it out. <laughs> Sometimes it does. Um Bonnie's got the, the teaching takes a lot of other teacher, doesn't it? I am teaching part-time this year, actually. So it's not, um, it's not quite as bad. I teach for part of the day, so I can't really complain, but teaching full-time does take it out of you, but it's fun. It's very rewarding also. And my day has been pretty good. I hate taxes. If anybody here follows the FRQ Friday series, I recorded a, FRQ Friday video for tomorrow. I don't know that I'm going to be able to get it out tomorrow. I didn't get started on editing it at all today. I only got it recorded, which means I have to edit it all tomorrow afternoon. So, and I also have some crash course editing to do. I don't know if you guys know this, but there's a new crash course climate and energy series. So that's been super exciting, but I've also been helping with that. So you can go check that out if you're interested. Um, then I dug some some holes in my backyard to uh, put in a fence so the dog can run around in the backyard. Um, so it's been a pretty good day. I also got to do a little reading. So not too bad of a day. Thanks for asking. Another good question. I know really good experienced smart AP teachers who do this apple cake. So I think it's a fine way to do it. Um, no, no problem with starting with four. The reason some teachers do this is because four is earth science. And a lot of you have really good earth science background from middle school already. And they feel that it doesn't fit quite as well with some of the other units. So that's why some people do unit four first. If your teacher does that, I don't think there's any issue with it. Uh, in fact, if your teacher does this, it, it potentially means that your teacher is really experienced and that they have a specific reason for doing that apple cake. So I give it a thumbs up. If it works for them, awesome. And I know really experienced apes teachers who, who choose to do this. All right. We got to get into it. Got to get into unit five. Otherwise, we'll be here all night. It has been fun, though. I do enjoy chatting with Ape Scholars, getting to know you guys a little bit better, uh, building the community here. It's awesome to see people coming and reviewing for their semester exams because what happens is at the end of the year, when you have the actual exam in May, you get all these people show up and it's like the first time they've ever watched a video or like studied for Apes at all. Um, whereas I know you guys, you are the dedicated viewers watching this now in December. All right. We're going to try to do the biggest sort of bang for our buck topics here. The things where we're going to get the most out of reviewing them since we can't do all 17 topics. So let's talk about effects of clear cutting. When you clear cut, you remove all of the vegetation in an area. You retrieve, you remove all of the tree's roots so now the soil can easily erode away into the river. So whoever asked about turbidity 
a while ago, this is turbidity. <laughs> All that sediment loosened by the loss of that root structure, it flows into this river. On the other hand, if you do selective cutting, which is basically the antidote or the solution is clear cutting, you leave a lot of the trees intact, especially older, more mature trees. Um, I, sorry, especially younger trees that can move in and take the place of those older mature trees that you cut down. So not only do you increase the maximum sort of sustainable yield that you can continually take from that forest, but you leave habitat intact, you shade the soil so it doesn't get hot and dry out from the sun, you shade the river water so it doesn't get hot by the sun's rays beating down directly on it, and you are going to help anchor that soil. So, so many reasons that clear cutting is beneficial over, I'm sorry, selective cutting is beneficial over clear cutting. It's been a long day and it's the end of the night for me, if you can't tell. Another really important slide because mm, the formatting is messed up. Um, that's not why it's important. It's just, I uh, just noticed that. But something about when I converted it, I think, from slides to PDF or something. But ignoring that, the stomata of leaves are a really underlooked part of air filtration, meaning students often know that trees filter air, but they don't often know that it's actually the stomata that can sometimes take in some of these pollutants and trap the pollutants in the leaves, or that the leaves themselves can actually catch particulate matter and keep that from getting into people's lungs. So this is how trees actually filter air. And of course, through photosynthesis, they store carbon dioxide. So big benefits of trees that are great reasons not to clear cut and to try to do selective cutting. So good question here. Let's actually skip all the way down to, um, oh, actually it's not, I don't have it in this same presentation. So let's actually just go to um, a slide up here. So the reason we should do this selective cutting is because it's going to help preserve habitat, anchor the soil so that it doesn't erode and provide shade to the soil and the water so that we don't have increased soil and stream temperature due to the loss of shade. So a lot of good reasons to do selective cutting. All right, we're going to go through some of the Agricultural practices that you should know, um, GMOs are genetically modified crops that can be genetically engineered to grow faster, grow larger, more yield per acre. They can also be uh, genetically modified to resist pests. So BT corn or BT crops are a great example. Pests don't eat them because they have this genetic trait that allows them to actually create a protein that the pest um, is killed when it eats eats the plant. So it's deterred from doing that. On the other hand, though, they reduce genetic diversity basically to nothing. And so they're potentially susceptible to a disease if it is capable of inflicting damage on them. And you have no biodiversity to preserve uh, genetic traits that may be helpful in the case of that event. So you're kind of putting all your eggs in one basket with GMOs. Another topic we should understand is synthetic fertilizer and eutrophication. Eutrophication is the most misquoted or misused term in all of apes. <clears throat> eutrophication is the process of too many nutrients or excess nutrients entering a body of water. So when you use synthetic fertilizer on your crops as a farmer, it's very possible and in fact likely for that rainfall to carry that nitrate off of your fields and into nearby waters, which leads to an algae bloom, covers the surface and uses up oxygen when these algae die because the decomposers do this aerobic decomposition and use up that oxygen. So that can lead to a dead zone. Also using these synthetic uh, fossil fuel-based fertilizers leads to climate change via CO2 emissions. Also agricultural soils that have a lot of fertilizer put on them give off nitrous oxide. So a bunch of issues with using synthetic fertilizer. All right, we're going to skip past 
agriculture here, and we're gonna go ahead to pest control. So pesticides unfortunately have this side effect of in addition to killing insects or killing the pest, they can lead to resistance. So what happens is you spray your fields with a pesticide, it kills all the insects that are susceptible or that can be killed by that pesticide, but the ones that survive have genetic resistance and they pass it on to their offspring. So pretty soon you've got to invent a new pesticide to kill these resistant pests. And we call this the pesticide treadmill. It just keeps going because you have to just keep presenting, presenting, inventing and applying new pesticides. Uh, you probably present to a board before you, you know, apply the pesticides. At any rate, this is an issue because we can see in this graph, as we use these more and more BT crops, we get resistant species. Um, so these BT crops, even the GMO crops are going to lead to resistance because the pests eventually, all of them that die when they eat it, weren't resistant. Only the ones that survive when they eat it are resistant. And eventually you get more and more resistant pests. All right, we're going to go on to meat production here in a second. All right, so the big thing we need to know here is that meat is inefficient when it comes to land, energy, and water use. And the reason for this is the second law of thermodynamics. So basically, when you put energy into growing a plant, you could just eat that plant. Or you could take tons and tons and tons and tons of that plant and feed it to a cow and then eat that cow. That's the basic way to think about it. So because roughly 10% of the energy from corn or grass or whatever crop you're growing to feed to a cow actually makes it there, you need a lot more land to grow all that food for the cow. And then you eat the cow as opposed to just eating the plant itself. So when you eat meat, it just takes up more energy because of all of that planting of its food. But then of course, all the land and space that's taken up and all the water that's taken to grow those crops. So it's not like all the water is just drank by the cow. Some of it, the cow drinks, but a lot of it actually irrigated the crops that the cow had to eat. So that is one big problem with meat. Another is manure lagoons, although that's not the slide we wanted. There's the manure lagoon. So because we've got to store all the waste, there's the potential for that waste to get out and contaminate nearby water sources, but also that waste gives off um, greenhouse gases. So you can give off some uh, nitrous oxide, but the cows themselves also burp out uh, methane and carbon dioxide and fart out methane and carbon dioxide. All right. We're going to go on to mining briefly here so we can talk about some of the effects. When humans disrupt land for mining, we of course have soil erosion. We're going to have habitat loss. We're going to also have increased particulate matter in the air. So the air is going to become dustier. It's going to have more particles in it that can get into people's lungs. That can be harmful to people. Um, and so that is one environmental drawback uh, and specifically human health drawback of mining. We've got different types of mining here, which you can see in the diagram. Mountaintop removal is one of the most destructive because you actually explode the mountain and basically you fill in all that rubble, that overburden that you've got to dig out of the way. Um, and you fill that into the nearby valley and it can cover up and contaminate streams. So that's another big issue. And then eventually as ore gets harder and harder to find near the surface, we've got to go deeper into the earth to do subsurface mining. And that becomes more expensive because you have to pay more healthcare costs for workers that get injured. Um, you have to pay higher insurance policies because it's more likely that a worker gets injured. So a couple of reasons that subsurface mining is more challenging and um, time consuming, cost consuming. Great question. Does mining cause turbidity? Absolutely. 
So your streams nearby a mining site are likely to have some of that fill or overburden that's taken away from the mining site actually dumped right into a stream. Or just the fact that soil is looser in the area um, can lead to turbidity in that stream. Also really common to have flash floods where you have mountaintop removal because you have no more vegetation. So it rains really hard. What's there to stop the rain from, from flowing down the mountain and carrying soil with it? All right, great question. We're going to jump ahead a little bit to sustainable agriculture here. And talk about windbreaks because they are a great way to do sustainable agriculture. The only problem is for some reason, these slides that I have up just don't have the sustainable agriculture stuff in them. So let me see if I can pull them up. In the meantime, though, a windbreak is going to do what it sounds like. It's going to break the wind so that those trees or that those um, shrubs that got hit with the wind prevent some of that wind from carrying away soil with it. And because if you're a farmer, soil is one of your most precious resources. So you don't want to lose that soil if you can help it. Well, StreamYard's being really uncooperative, so having a hard time finding the slides that deal with windbreaks. But great question. Hopefully you guys can all visualize it. You can always Google windbreak. All right, I think the last topic we're gonna have time for tonight in unit five, before we wrap up with just a couple questions, is urban stormwater runoff. Very important concept. Unfortunately, um, because I'm not in present mode, <laughs> some of my slides are covered up here. But you guys get the idea that all of the pollutants that are on an urban surface, because it's impermeable, meaning that the water can't sink in and infiltrate down beneath it, are going to be carried into a storm drain and then entered into a body of water, in this case, the Chesapeake Bay. It's really important to know specific pollutants like salt, sediment, fertilizer, pesticide, oil and gasoline from cars, and not just to talk about pollution vaguely. If you have an FRQ tomorrow on your unit, um, well, your semester exam or whenever it is, very likely that on that FRQ, you will have some opportunity to talk about a specific pollutant. And when you do, you want to make sure you don't say pollution, talk about a specific pollutant, and remember one of these pollutants that's on the screen here. Another important concept <coughs> is infiltration. So remember that infiltration is this idea of rainwater being able to sink into the soil, whereas runoff is water that flows across the surface because it can't infiltrate. And so when you build up an area or you use more um, pavement and, and concrete and asphalt in it, you're going to decrease the infiltration and increase the runoff. You're going to make this pavement this surface impermeable. Now, one of the solutions, one of the ways you can mitigate that, mitigates another important word you should know, is with rain gardens. Rain gardens can allow water to sink into the soil and infiltrate or recharge the groundwater rather than just flowing across the surface and into storm drains and into bodies of water. Permeable pavement is another thing you can do. Um, so if you guys haven't seen this, Google permeable pavement. And it's a really neat process that basically just allows rainwater to basically sink through pavement instead of running off of it. So it's going to greatly reduce or mitigate urban stormwater runoff. All right. We had one final question here. We might have a couple questions. Um, but Myra asked about the rain shadow effect. Let's touch on the rain shadow effect. It's all the way back in unit four, but it is an important topic to, to look at. So let's actually pop back there really quickly um, because the rain shadow effect is not tough to understand. So if you get a question about it and you review this slide, I think you have a pretty good chance of understanding the rain shadow effect. Basic idea is when you have prevailing winds coming in off a body of water, 
they're picking up a lot of moisture from that water through evaporation. And they're going to deposit that moisture onto land because that air is going to, in this case, hit a mountain and rise up and it's going to start to cool. Now, air that's cooler can't hold as much moisture. And so that moisture is going to be lost. It's going to rain down on this windward side of the mountain, the side that's facing the wind. This is why you're going to have a lot of rainfall closer to the shoreline and on this side of the mountain that the wind is hitting. Then it gets up and over and it goes to the leeward side of the mountain and you're going to have much drier, cooler, arid conditions there where you don't have nearly as much rain because it's already rained on the windward side of the mountain. So it looks like Myra was actually asking about wind breaks. That's okay though. Uh, no problems there. Wind breaks are this are these agricultural uh, ideas of planting trees along your fields so that you absorb some of the wind's force and prevent it from eroding some of your topsoil. I see what you're saying. Good, good question. The mountain um, is somewhat of a windbreak, but more so what it does, Myra, is it pushes that air up. And as that air gets further from Earth's surface, it's going to get cooler. Cooler air can't hold as much moisture. And so now that precipitation is going to fall. So that's the actual reason there. Um, thermal inversion is actually all the way in unit seven. I'm not going to touch on it tonight just because for most people, it's not going to be on their exam. But Speedy, um, go watch video 7.3. I think it's 7.3 on my channel. It'll go all, all through thermal inversion. Coriolis effect is not... Oh, good question. Mm, I want to say no. This is an interesting question. Because my understanding of the Coriolis effect is simply that it's this idea that as the Earth spins, um, winds that are traveling back towards the equator from you know, 30 degrees north or from 30 degrees south are deflected, essentially. They're traveling in a straight line, but because the earth is spinning beneath them, to us, we perceive them as being deflected. I should probably show you this slide instead of just doing this. That probably doesn't help all that much. I don't believe that El Nino and La Nina are really affecting the Coriolis effect. They're going to change wind patterns but I don't think they're changing the Coriolis effect itself because that effect comes from the deflection of objects as Earth spins beneath them or the appearance of deflection, so to speak. So again, Coriolis effect is this idea that this air traveling from 30 degrees towards the equator, it's traveling due south. It's going in like a dead straight line. But because the Earth spins beneath it west to east, it's going to be deflected or it's going to look to us. We're going to perceive it on Earth's surface as going in a westward, as westward direction. So that's the Coriolis effect for you. All right. I know I told you, I told you guys biome stuff was not that critical, but you stayed around all the way to the end, um, Anushka, and you asked about biome. So let, let's go back through them. This will be, this will be kind of what we wrap up with. So persistence pays, we can go back over, over biomes. One thing to remember um, is that more important, I think, than memorizing all the biomes is this idea that they are regions that have temperature and precipitation patterns. That's really what makes up all of the other characteristics of them. And that tells you what kind of organisms you're going to find there. So remember that organisms have to be adapted to the conditions of their biome. So it's not the desert because there are camel and cacti there. There are camel and cacti there because it is the desert. They have unique adaptations to low precipitation that is characteristic of the desert. So we will review a few of them here. Um, if you take a look here, Anushka, you can see that they're distributed with some fair like consistency. So if we go up to higher latitudes, north or south of 60 degrees, that's where we're going to see tundra and boreal forest. 
Um, so let me cover your, or remove your question actually, just so people can see the, the key. So the tundra is way at the top. That's your kind of um, turquoise blue there. That's going to be your farthest north, typically farthest north, typically very low precipitation, quite cold temperatures most of the year. Then you get into the boreal forest, which is going to be cold, but it is going to have a growing season. So there's going to be enough months in the boreal forest that are not below freezing. That water is um, liquid at that temperature. So you have uh, these boreal forests characterized by a lot of uh, coniferous trees. So, you know, pine trees you can think of. Then you get down a little bit lower. That's where we get to our temperate climate. That's in 30 to 60 degree latitudes. And so if we look in there, we're going to see this grassland. We're also going to see a little bit of subtropical desert. Uh, and we're going to see a little bit of woodland and shrubland. In California, if anybody's from California, sometimes you guys call it chaparral. Um, and so that is another thing to, to look out for. Sometimes they have different names. And then finally, when we get into tropical regions, these are going to be near the equator. These are going to be really warm, really high rainfall areas. And this is our tropical rainforest and our tropical um, seasonal forest or the savanna. And so just remember that biomes are not just randomly thrown out across earth. They are highly dependent on these latitudes because those latitudes give them consistent temperature and precipitation patterns. All right. I think that does it for tonight's review. Um, thank you so much uh, for showing up, everybody. Like I said, it's fun to see Ape Scholars here in the chat asking questions. Always a good time. Uh, and when you start studying now for your semester one final, it's so much easier to study in May for the final final, the one that actually counts for college credit. Um, so props to all of you. Again, if you come to the review session that I do in April for the final exam, you're going to see way more people here and they're going to be like, last minute gang, you know, watch the videos on two times speed. And it's uh, sometimes it's too little too late. So all of you, I think, are going to do great because you're here motivated um, early and often studying. So thank you guys again for showing up. I wish you the best of luck on your exams tomorrow or whenever they are. If you already had it, sorry that this review was late. Um, if you have it in an upcoming week, maybe next week or the week after you get back from break in January, I'm actually going to do one more semester one review in January because I know some students have their exams in January and I'll do a little bit more Q&A in that. So if you guys want to come back for that, even if your exam's tomorrow, I can answer more questions in that January session because we did a lot of this review here, they can just come back and watch this, this review. Oh, look at that. We do have a GRP student representing. Reed is uh, saying, thank you for being background noise while uh, I make gift bags for my teachers. Excellent. Go read. We've got a GRP student representing here making gift bags for their teachers. And I hate taxes with the uh is that clefairy I, I don't know my my pokemon super well that looks like an original 150 though i'm thinking that's clefairy um says they'll be tuning into that future review so looking forward to that you love to see the dedicated ape scholars commenting on lots of videos so thank you guys so much it's been a lot of fun but i gotta get to bed so good luck tomorrow you guys know the drill oh it's jigglypuff but as a ditto Interesting. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, I gotcha. Ditto puff. Okay. Kyra, Kyra gets uh Kyra gets the joke. Okay, awesome. Um, and yes, we did uh Spring Bonnie, we did make our edible aquifers. They were delicious. Glad you got to have that experience as well. If you guys didn't make edible aquifers at your school, ask your teacher to do it. If they Google it, they'll find instructions. It's a lot of fun. All right. Yes. As always, there we go. You guys can do the sign off. Think like a mountain. Oh, and write like a scholar. There we go. There's our sign off. Last question of the night. Um, this studio is in, is in my house. So I used to film at school. Uh, you might see me in my classroom in some of my screencastify videos from a long time ago, but this, this is at home. So I can just go right next door, do a little reading and then, and then hit the hay. So thank you everybody. Have a great night. 
Uh, think like mountains, write like scholars, and best of luck on your exams whenever they are.